Today we're turning to the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. I'm going to read just a few verses, 17 through 22. And as we hear them, this is Paul's word to the church, and let it be also God's word to us. Jesus came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through Him we both have access to the Father by the Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And also members of his household build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The word of the Lord. Pray with me. Lord, say something to us now of faith and of growth and the promise of proclaiming our trust in You and the life that glorifies Your risen Son, our Savior. In Him we pray. Amen. So I tried to do some math this week. Uh, thinking of my own confirmation, and depressingly, I realized that long before Pastor Michael was born, many, many years before Pastor Michael was born, I stood in front of a congregation about two hours south of here, the Elliott Creek Presbyterian Church. On, in that church, a good Sunday would have been 25 people. There were three of us being confirmed, as I remember it, and there may have been 25 people in the sanctuary that day. And as confirming eighth graders always is, that moment was an act of hope, an act of looking forward. You know, there's a certain irony in bringing people into the church at the moment you're 13, 14 years, and let's be honest, not the high point for most of us. Baby giraffe, basically. You think you know some stuff, you have no idea, but you don't even have an idea that you have no idea. So you think, oh, I'm ready for this, whatever this is. And amidst that season of most of the most awkward moments of our life, we say welcome to church. And there's a certain beauty in that. You know, as I thought about it, confirmation is really, as an eighth grader, 13, 14, it's one of the first adult things that you do. It's one of the first real steps, if you're in the church, toward adulthood. Driving is still a couple years off. Some of the markers that we look to are still in the future. And for me, there wasn't, I couldn't say, a, a real change. The church didn't treat me any different. They still saw me as an annoying 13-year-old kid, which I very much was. I was fortunate in that small town to know lots of people and already feel like the church was a community. And so there was not really a sense of anything being different. And as I look back now, I, I shake my head both at that young man and at the idea of where things went from there. In that moment, I could not imagine where that simple act of proclaiming faith and joining a church would even begin to lead me in my life. Where I would go with Jesus and church. And over the years since then, in the words of one pastor, I have spent an almost unforgivable amount of time in the church. It is a big, strange, interesting family that we're a part of. I have seen us at our worst. I have seen us be petty. I have seen us argue over the dumbest things you can imagine. I have seen us in moments of caring too much about ourselves and our stuff hurt others and not care enough about outsiders. And I have seen us at our best 
I have seen moments when we get it right and there is no place on earth like the church when we get it right. I have seen us be Christ-like. I have seen us forgive. I have seen us, seen us love. I have seen us care for people whose lives were in turmoil. I have seen the church change people's lives, save people's marriages, welcome outsiders as they put their lives back together. The church is an incredible, amazing place when we live up to our calling in Jesus Christ. A lot of the time we're human, but in those rare moments that we transcend that, we are something better. And for most of us, that's the hope, that's the promise, that ex that's the experience that allows us to hang in there with the church and to seek to make it the best place it can be. So this week, I've been thinking about confirmation and what it means to be in church. And I've thought about being in church versus being in church. On the one hand, when I was 13, I thought now I'll be in the church. But what I meant is I'll go sit in the building. I'll do stuff in church when they asked me. As a young kid, I thought that was it. I thought church was like some other club. You went there. You did stuff, you paid your dues, and that was about it. Fortunately, that young person came to understand there's more to it than that. There's another entirely different way to be in church, and that is to be connected. That is to be part of a family. That is to rub shoulders and interact with people who inspire you by their faith, by their tenacity, by their ability to hold on to hope. Friends, I have seen people face their death with dignity, with joy, with confidence. I have seen people face tragedy and not let it break them. I have been inspired and moved by the stories of faith I see in any old ordinary church being in church teaches you it guides you it changes your life as you follow Jesus together with brothers and sisters it becomes the foundation of what it means to be faithful And if you've experienced that, if you've ever had that kind of moment of being in church, a feeling like you belong there, a feeling like this place accepts me, loves me, this place challenges me, confronts me, helps me grow, this place shows me Jesus Christ. If you've ever had that moment, most of us didn't know that when we joined. We had no idea that it would change us. Where that simple act where maybe once upon a time we stood in front of a church as a 13, 14 year old kid and we said, I think this is for me. I want to follow Jesus Christ. I want to try and be faithful. There's something in that that I think I want to be a part of and I think I want to do it in this place. And if we're honest, we had no idea what we'd find there. What that would mean. That we would find in those moments far more than belonging to a club. That we would find ourselves belonging to the body of Jesus Christ. And that in that, we would find our family who is often messy but sometimes beautiful and who often gets it wrong but when we get it right we point to Jesus Christ. 
Today, as we welcome our confirmation students, we are grateful for this first step on a journey that they certainly don't know where it will lead. But we know who is leading them. And for that, we are grateful. Well, while Clint can remember confirmation while I did not yet exist, I, friends, never had confirmation. I never once stood in front of a congregation and got to do what you get to do today. And I think maybe that's the reason why I love confirmation. It's really, honestly, one of my favorite services the entire year, and the reason for that is simple. I don't think there's another time in church when we honor all of the people in the room quite like we do Confirmation Sunday. Students, take this for example. In this room right now are people whose hands built the room that we now sit. They remember putting up the stone that you see around you, the wood that I'm standing on, the place where we meet, the, the place we think of as church. Some of those people sit in this room today who helped make it possible. And yet we also remember that there's all of those who have gone on already ahead of us. Those who helped form this church. In fact, there are people in this room whose grandparents and great-grandparents were the founding members of this congregation. People seeking to follow Jesus Christ. And in our text for today, we're told that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And confirmants, when you come into the church, you are connected to a history far greater than you can imagine right now. Not just the people here who make this place possible, but those who have come far before them. What of those who brought Christianity to this nation? The, those who... For years before that, all the way back to 1517, the one who goes and posts a thing on a door in front of a church and starts the Reformation. What about a thousand years before that, the Christians who died, the martyrs who sought to live their lives faithfully so that today you would have a faith to profess. You see, when you come to be part of the First Presbyterian Church, it's somewhat of an illusion. It feels like you're just joining this group of people. But today we're reminded that there are literally hundreds of people worshiping with us who we do not see. And that's right now around the country. Friends, we have to imagine that when you come to be part of the church, when you profess your faith, it's not just in the circle of those who you see and know. But you're joined with a story that is literally thousands of years old. You become part of a story much bigger than yourselves. The writer to the Ephesians also says that Jesus is the cornerstone. And I think that's a really interesting image. We might miss what it means. Uh, when you went to build a building, you would care about what way the building faced, right? And so one of the ways that you would make sure the building faced the right direction is you would make doubly sure that the first foundation stone faced the right direction. And then you'd want to make sure that that stone was really firm because nobody wants the leaning tower of Pisa when you get done. The first block was always important because that was the thing that determined everything that came after it. And so the same with Jesus Christ. If we don't know who Jesus is, if we don't go to confirmation and learn what we believe about him, if we don't make that mean something to us, then our lives will always get built in the wrong direction. You have to start in the right place if you're going to end up going in the direction that you intend. And I think that's what happens next as we're told that the whole point of this is to be built together into a holy temple. And what is a temple other than a place where we're reminded that there's more to life than ourselves? The temple points us to the one beyond ourselves, to the one who calls us to offer up our praise and worship. And what I think is so interesting about Ephesians is it's not just a story about 
being in a church that's bigger than you or a faith that is yours to own and to claim. But it's about the people who it joins you with. Because it says that we're built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives. And there's this interesting phrase, in him you two are being built. If you could read Greek, you would see that this, this is intentionally an action that doesn't end. You are being built. It's not something that was done, and it's not something that will happen in the future. It's something that is happening now and will continue to happen. And that is, I think, one of the greatest mysteries of confirmation is that today you profess something to be true, and yet you will live in the truth of that day after day after day. The reality is, you will be built every day through high school. I actually think there's something beautiful about confirmation happening now that you're a freshman, because the truth is, it doesn't stop when you leave eighth grade and begin high school. No, it's, it continues today. It will go with you far past your seasons of playing football and basketball, volleyball and softball. It will go with you when you go to college, when you get your first job. It will go with you if you get married, if you have a first child. Each of these are important moments in a life. But friends, each one of them, God is still working within you. He is still building a dwelling within you. And this is the final point that matters. In confirmation, we learn that it never was about the building. It really even wasn't necessarily about the group of people who we become part of. It's what God intends to do within us. Because God intends for us to become the temple. The writer says, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Can you imagine that? God doesn't want to live in the church. He wants to live in you. He really does. So the question is, will we make space for him in our lives? If he's going to build us into a dwelling place, will we participate in what he calls us to be? This is, I think, the thing that I miss not having confirmation. Because the beautiful thing is, this is a snapshot in time. A moment in which you will be able to look back on and reflect and say, that is where my faith was? I can't believe it. Because now I'm here. Each one of these gifts will be a constant reminder to you of this day. But as your faith grows, you will be surprised to learn how much deeper it goes. Because the truth is, those same people who are in this place whose hands built this place have lived in the hope and promise of their confirmation. They have been built into dwellings in which God lives. And now I want to be clear. That changes you. It makes you a different person. Coming to church isn't just about fulfilling a weekly obligation. It's about allowing God to do something in you you could not have imagined for yourself. And if you allow that to happen, if you allow God to build a new habitation within you, it will transform your life. So that one day you will look back on this day and you will join your voices with those that said, I could have never imagined what God could do if I was willing to let him in. Now, don't take my word for it. This week we asked the people of this congregation to tell us what church means to them. And guys, listen, let's be honest, straight talk. Confirmands, sometimes you came to confirmation because mom and dad made you come, right? Yeah. Faith is not reasonable. It's not just important because your mom and dad think it, but because they join their voices with this entire church family who knows that if you allow Christ to work within you, he will transform you into a person you couldn't imagine being. 
that a place that you had to come, even though it meant waking up early, might someday be a place that you can't imagine not going. Don't take my word for it. Hear theirs. What has church meant to me? That's a really fun question. Um, all my life I've gone to church with my family and attended lots of things with children's choir practice as a child and youth fellowship meetings and VBS and all the things that, that many of you take part in here at our church. This is Bernie Van Ruckel calling in to share my thoughts on what the role the church has played in my life. Um, the church has always been a, a major part of my life. I was born into a Christian family. Uh, I was baptized in the church ever since I can remember. Uh, I went to church every morning and when I was younger at evening services, so I went in the evening. This is Sharma Brockmeyer, just calling in um, to record something about uh, what the church has meant to me and uh, my family. Growing up, I always went to church, uh, to our local church, and it was kind of something that was always required. But as I grew older and I had my own family, I knew it would be important um, that I raise my family as well uh, to have a faith uh, that they can rely on and that they can grow and learn more about God um, so that they could uh, be a better person. Gary Olson calling in response to the email. I grew up in a home with Christian parents who were very committed to church participation. This church has been the driving force of my life from uh, my baptism until the present time. This is Carolyn Butterworth. First Presbyterian Church Spirit Lake has been a big part of my life since I was born. I was baptized here as an infant and confirmed when I was in eighth grade. So it was in this church that I learned about Jesus and grew in my faith through Sunday school and youth activities both as a child and as an adult, through worship services, Bible studies, program and leadership activities, and from so many loving, caring people who have guided me throughout my life. Hello, this is John Stover. The church has always been an important part of my life. The church through worship helps me to feel God's presence and helps me to focus on living for Him. The church transforms me. The church, to me, is a beautiful picture of God's plan playing out in his people. Uh, there's a biblical phrase that says, iron sharpens iron, and it, it basically means to me that when I'm meeting with other believers and hearing the war word, it's a source of encouraging me and strengthening me uh, in my personal belief and allowing me to continue to grow spiritually, which I think is an ongoing life process. I think of the word joy when I think of going to church. I think of that relationship that we are building with Jesus and growing with others and growing ourselves. The word joy, Jesus, others, and you. We wouldn't be where we are today, and and having that relationship with so many people uh, really did connect us to God, but it also connected us more uh, to the people of our church, and, and the love that they shared to us was is just incredible. You can do things cohesively to be a light to the community, to... Uh, be part of the Great Commission of Spreading God's Word and just uh, helping us to become centered in our lives so that uh, Jesus Christ is, is the center of everything that we do. I pray that each of you confirmants will continue to grow in your faith for a lifetime.